Okay, welcome back everyone um, to the penultimate uh, session of the uh, Where Do We Go From Here conference. Um, in some ways it's uh, this panel right here in some ways encapsulates all of the intentions that I at least had for this conference. Um, and by that, I mean, um, our goal was to bring together people from a variety of disciplines, from different perspectives who do work in different contexts to think together about Black Irish relations and what that means in multiple times and places. Um, it's also been a real opportunity to uh, introduce ourselves and each other to the work of people that we might not necessarily come across. Um, and the hope being that we can continue these conversations either on the page or in person at some future date um, or in more online spaces like this. Um, it's also, as many of you might know by now, if you saw my talk um, or heard from Miriam, it's a personally important set of questions we're dealing with. And so when I thought about this conference, the first person I said I'd like to have was James Carroll. And the reason is also tied to some of the stuff that I talked about in my piece um, when I mentioned a place called Packard Vance. Um, the, last, the first time I saw Jim Carroll was at Packard Vance about 42 years ago um, at my friend Chrissy's house. And I, it was just after you had published Mortal Friends. Um, and in came this uh, tall, handsome author. And I was so impressed that he was right there. I've actually never seen Jim since then until this very moment. Um, but the uh, impact of his work um, and the kind of work people were doing collectively at Pack Advance has been a touchstone for me throughout my life. So thank you for that indulgence. Um, it's meaningful for me to, to have this space. At the same time, um, Kendra Field, Professor Field, uh, I have the good fortune to now know um, through the connections we have in our in mutual really good friends, good people who are doing really important scholarship and work in the world um, to address some of the issues that are central to this conference. Um, and so it's a real treat and a pleasure to bring Kendra into this space to have this conversation. So with that, let me say a few words about uh, Kendra and then she will introduce Jim. Uh, Dr. Kendra Field is Associate Professor in History in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University. She's Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and Co-Founder and Co-Director with C Carrie Greenwich of the African American Trail Project. Field's work centers on family history, kinship, and the Black intellectual tradition. She's the author of Growing Up with the Country, Family, Race, and Nation After the Civil War, published by Yale, which traced her own ancestor search for a more free place in the Black towns and settlements of Indian Territory and Oklahoma. Her current book project, The Stories We Tell, which will be published by W.W. Norton, is a history of African-American genealogy from the Middle Passage to the present. Previously, she served as assistant editor to David Levering Lewis's W.E.B. Du Bois biography, um, published in 2009. Uh, Kendra's received many awards for her work and been involved in many public history endeavors, including numerous historical documentaries, most recently Tulsa Burning, the 1921 Race Massacre. And she serves as a historical consultant for the Clinton Church Preservation Project, a new museum dedicated to the life of W.E.B. Du Bois and Black heritage in the Berkshires, uh, where I currently am right now, and through which I also um, connected to, uh, to Kendra. Uh, Kendra received her PhD in American history from NYU 
She holds a master's in public policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and a BA from Williams College. Over to you, Kendra. Thank you so much um, for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here um, with all of you today. Um, we will get right to it. I'm going to introduce um, our, our speaker today, James Carroll, and I look forward to a conversation uh, afterwards. James Carroll is the author of 12 novels, most recently The Cloister, which the New York Times called Incandescent, and nine works of nonfiction, including The Truth at the Heart of the Lie, which is a beautiful, beautiful memoir and, and history that I'm just in the middle of and enjoying so much, <laughs> um, which was just published in 2021. Other books include the National Book Award winning and American, American Requiem, the New York Times bestselling Constantine Sword, which is also a documentary, House of War, which won the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award, and Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which was named a 2011 best book by Publishers Weekly. His op-ed column appeared weekly, of course, in the Boston Globe for 23 years, and his numerous essays appear um, at newyorker.com. And it's just a pleasure uh, to be in conversation uh, with James Carroll today, and I look forward to um, our conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kendra. I want to start by saying how deeply honored I am to be part of this magnificent conversation, to add my voice to those of the distinguished speakers who precede me. Actually, an astounding assembly of witnesses confronting a question that has urgent importance for Black people and Irish people on both sides of the Atlantic. I want to thank especially Kim DeCosta, and Kim, you're reminding me of our encounter at Packard Mance all those years ago. It's deeply moving. Thank you for that. Wonderful to see you again. And Miriam Nyan Gray, who I'm pleased to say has become a friend, their invitation to join you is precious to me. Speaking as an Irish American and as an Irish Catholic, fully aware of my complicity in the crimes of white supremacy, nothing matters more to me in this transition, in this transnational moment than the question they pose, where do we go from here? My subject is the politics of white supremacy, a view from Irish Boston. Over these weeks, we have been challenged to consider the tension between whiteness and Irishness, to ask how identity is at the service of power, to hear the black demand for a comprehensive moral reckoning. We've been called to undertake the work of history as a way to set people free, confronting American mythologies and Irish denial. The previous sessions of this conference are the context for the text that I present now. I am here as a writer from Boston, my home for more than 50 years, the traumatic era during which black Irish relations in America reached a terrible climax. No academic, I can only offer glimpses from the ground of how this painful history has played out in the city where the black Irish encounter has been so fraught that its name, Boston, still functions as a kind of synonym for Irish American racism. Yet we have begun a new day in Boston this past Tuesday, as you all know, Michelle Wu, a 36-year-old Taiwanese-American lawyer, was sworn in as the mayor of Boston, taking over from Kim Janey, an African-American woman who served as acting mayor since Marty Walsh resigned to become President Biden's Secretary of Labor. If Boston is regarded as the northern quintessence of white supremacy, 
then Mayor Wu's election is an earthquake. Beginning in 1884, 12 Irish American males served as mayor of Boston with an unbroken string of them running from 1930 to Marty Walsh himself, with the single exception of the Italian American Thomas Menino, who was a wonderful mayor. But this week, the mayor's office isn't the only scene of shakeup. 12 years ago, Ayanna Presley was the first woman of color elected to the Boston City Council. After this month's election, the 13 member council members include eight women, seven people of color, and only three white men. Of course, Ayanna Presley, having replaced a white man again, is now a powerful congresswoman representing Boston where the Suffolk County District Attorney is a black woman, Rachel Rollins. All this in a city famous for a baseball team that long refused to integrate and for an Irish mob storming the federal building to get at Ted Kennedy because he supported forced busing. Yes, it's a new day in Boston, thank God. Even if black rates of employment, net worth, and home ownership remain wildly below white rates, even if black infants are still far more likely to die than white infants, even if in America, according to Harvard researchers. The only group more likely to die of COVID than black women is black men. All of that suggests, of course, that the politics of white supremacy in Boston, as everywhere, is less a matter of individual prejudice than of systems, laws, and policies, the heavily fortified structure of inequality. It's been a theme in these NYU sessions. Whiteness, as we heard last week from Professor Nikhil Singh, is a way of organizing power, not a statement about biology a hoped for seismic shift in the outcome of an election, what Boston experienced this month, is not an end, but a beginning. As I began by acknowledging, I am no academic, yet I am an expert in the assumptions of Irish, white, supremacy. It defined the culture into which I was born and against which, almost unwillingly, I set myself. My biography is not the point of my remarks, but it is a kind of exhibit A for the Black Irish legacy that has been unpacked so powerfully over these three weeks. I am here to make a report from Boston, but how I came to this city half a century ago and what I carried here with me is to the point. Received Irish white supremacy is not an abstraction. It's a lived experience. So please indulge me while I speak now and then quite personally, making in effect what we Catholics call an examination of conscience. I was born on the south side of Chicago in 1943, a proudly Irish neighborhood referred to then as back of the yards, behind the stockyards, in fact, a mile 
square animal killing complex where my father worked as one of those whose job was to control the flow of blood through pipes. The stench of livestock slaughter hanging in the air remains a first remembered sense memory of mine. The corporate meat packers had long employed legions of Irish immigrants and their children. Jobs at the stockyards had drawn African-Americans to Chicago's South Side early in the Great Migration, an arrival that was marked and marred by the infamous race riot of 1919, a week-long conflagration that killed dozens of people, most of whom were Black, and destroyed more than a thousand homes, again, mostly Black. That trauma of interracial violence was seared into the memory of both peoples, certainly including mine. Both my parents would speak to me of that terrible time, although like their Irish neighbors, they got it wrong. The steam, heat, and nothing to eat Irish assumed that their mortal enemy was the complete competing black worker. When of course, it was the armors and the swifts and the other owners of the yards who benefited when their low wage workers glared at each other instead of at them. If white supremacy is a way of organizing power, not a statement about biology. The question to ask is, what power interest benefits from Irish Black conflict? The answer is always the same. The owners, the bosses, the structure of finance capitalism. We will see where this comes from. My father took a wartime job in Washington, D.C. while I was still a baby. And my parents brought their deep sense of Irishness with us to Virginia. In the old south town of Alexandria, where I was raised, our being Irish carried more weight than ever, but influenced more by my playmates than by my folks. I grew into a competing identity initiated in the lost cause mythology of the war of Northern aggression, which seemed as my chums spoke of it to have occurred only the week before last. In truth, the white supremacist presuppositions of my Virginia playmates meshed nicely with the less blatant but still firm assumptions of my Irish Catholic family. When my buddies and I played at war, dodging imagined bullets in the woods, we were not Yanks shooting Germans and Japanese, but Johnny Rebs shooting Yankees. Our heroes, my heroes, were Jeb Stewart, Stonewall Jackson, and of course, Robert E. Lee. The crumbling stone walls behind which we hid in the woods had surely been built by slaves, but their experience was never referred to. In 1954, the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board of Education ruling was a first large news story that I took in. Only then did I notice that our Catholic school, St. Mary's, was entirely white. And I learned for the first time that there was another Catholic parish on the other side of Alexandria called St. Joseph's where black Catholics worshiped a dilapidated church separate 
and unequal. I was 11 years old and the fact of segregation hit me. I began to pay attention. In Virginia, the rejection of court ordered school integration was blatant, but I was blind to other subtler ways in which what should have been a major step toward integrated education and racial equality was undermined. In 1956, for example, the National Interstate and Defense Highway Act was passed, an essential element in the creation of the suburbs to which newly mobile white people could flee the cities rather than allow their children to go to school with blacks. An apparently unrelated infrastructure program would prove key to the maintenance of white supremacy. When it came to the rights of African-Americans, it was one step forward, two steps back, as it had been since Reconstruction and its aftermath. In 1960, I entered Georgetown University as a freshman, an institution that had admitted its first black student less than a decade before. I remember one black classmate. My buddies there were almost all Irish. Who would have thought that my enrollment in a Catholic college could have significance years later in the racial reckoning between Irish Catholics and Blacks. But this morning, we heard why this detail of my own story matters with Rachel Swan's stunning presentation building on her crucial reporting, the Irish American priests who sold human beings. How could that have been? Part of the answer is easy. As the cloak of slavery amnesia had fallen over my Virginia Woods playground, such denial had fallen over Georgetown too. Among students at Georgetown, even in my time, assumptions of lost cause nobility were vivid of students who had fought in the Civil War, a large majority went with the Confederacy and their memory at Georgetown was not denigrated. On the contrary, in my time, we were told to be proud of our school colors, blue and gray, as a living symbol of national reconciliation. But I would learn only years later that those school colors were adopted in 1876, the very year when union was preferred to justice, ending reconstruction and re-subjugating blacks. But in those early 1960s, first tremors of the coming civil rights earthquake could be felt. So the Jesuits told us students to be proud that in the 19th century, Georgetown had had an African-American president, Father Patrick Francis Healy, for whom our grandest building was named. But no one drew our attention to what this conference confronted last week and this morning, that Father Healy's racial heritage, born enslaved, passing as white, was his closely guarded secret, kept secret too, by the Jesuits. In 1960, our neighbor in Georgetown was Senator John F. Kennedy, the beau ideal of Irish American political hope. And kids like me threw ourselves into his campaign, a neck and neck contest with Richard Nixon. But boy, did we sit up that October when Kennedy intervened with phone calls to the Georgia governor and then to Coretta Scott King, 
to get Martin Luther King Jr. out of a brutal Georgia jail, an act his brother Bobby was sure would cost him the election. The deal Democrats had made, going back even to FDR, was to protect the interests of Southern whites against blacks, which is why the New Deal hadn't been dealt to them. But Kennedy's openly siding with the jailed civil rights leader then against those Southern whites did not cost him the election. What his visceral response to King did do was to change Kennedy and it changed us. John Kennedy served as the tribune of a new understanding of the idea of America. It does not discredit him or after him his brother Robert to say that they came in some way despite themselves to stand with black people. The brothers' late steps toward civil rights were decisive, especially President Kennedy's televised speech in June of 1963. That night, he cast the struggle for racial equality in an entirely new way. We face, therefore, he said, a moral crisis as a country and as a people. It cannot be met by repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the streets. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk. It is time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative body, and above all, in all of our daily lives. The issue was not mere personal prejudice, he was saying, but policies, laws, social structure, what would come to be called systemic racism, white supremacy in Professor Singh's phrase, as a way of organizing power. This is a subject, of course, that Republicans across this country today want to protect our children from learning about. As Kennedy was delivering that speech, Medgar Evers, the Mississippi Field Secretary for the NAACP was murdered. And the nation was faced more starkly than ever with its need for the moral transformation the president had just called for. In embracing the hope for such change and demonstrating its possibility in their own evolution, the Kennedys embodied an entire generation's idea of what America could be. And for many of us, John Kennedy and then Bobby accomplished that beginning as Irish men as Boston men and as Catholic men. Catholic, there's the rub. We cannot consider the Irish reckoning with race without considering Catholicism and its reckoning with race. At Georgetown, I heard the call as we say, and embraced the vocation to become a Catholic priest. Lucky for me, I entered the seminary just as the Second Vatican Council convened in Rome. Over the next seven years, my inherited assumptions were entirely overturned and I completely recast what I hoped to be as a priest around the ideal of ministry that I saw in Martin Luther King Jr. I wound up being a foot soldier in his poor people's campaign. But that was not the most drastic outcome of my transformation in the seminary. The Vatican Council was the church's attempt to confront the church failures 
that had been laid bare in the Holocaust. And its most important consequence was the change in Catholic teaching about the Jews, a renunciation of the Christ killer slander, the seed of anti-Semitism. You know this. But there was more. As we learned from the white nationalists in Charlottesville, who denounced in their phrase revealed in court only this week, Jews and their dark-skinned allies. The hatred of Jews goes hand in hand with the hatred of Blacks. How so? The story begins 2,000 years ago when the paradigmatic hatred of Western civilization was conceived in the antagonism between the church and the synagogue. It is not just that the Jews are labeled as Christ killers in the passion narratives, but that Jesus is fully portrayed throughout the gospel texts as fiercely opposed to his own Jewish people. If Jesus was merciful, Jews were condemning. If Jesus was generous, Jews were greedy. Soon enough, Christians imagined that Jesus had never really been Jewish to begin with. The imagined conflict persisted in forming the structure of Christian theology, church against synagogue, New Testament against old, Christian God of mercy against Jewish God of judgment. Down through the centuries, this positive negative bipolarity formed the twin pillars of European consciousness. And whenever the social equilibrium shook, Jews were targeted. Eventually, they were ruthlessly pressured to renounce their religion and to convert. But Jews steadily refused. Then something happened. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the era of the Inquisition, the church used violence to coerce Jewish conversion. And many Jews relented, accepting baptism. But guess what? You cannot trust a coerced conversion. The church suspected that Jewish conversion was not sincere. And in many cases, it wasn't. So soon enough, especially in Iberia, converted Jews were no longer regarded as full members of the Christian community. And this denigration became a matter of biology. Anyone born Jewish was by that fact a second class citizen, ineligible, for example, to hold municipal office. This exclusion soon applied not only to Jewish converts, but to their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. Laws were passed against anyone with Jewish blood. The so called blood impurity statutes. We are marking here the transformation of religious anti-Judaism into racial anti-Semitism. The main scene of this pivotal shift was the Iberian Peninsula. And the key date was, yes, 1492 the year not only of Christopher Columbus, but of the formal expulsion from Spain of the Jews, the racially impure people. Soon enough, this new trope of biological inferiority infected the imagination of Christendom itself. We spoke of the Jesuits before and asked, how could they? This is how. The constitutions of the Society of Jesus, founded in this era, forbid the admission to the order of anyone descended from a Jew to the fifth degree of family lineage. Great, 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 great grandparent. This is a dress rehearsal for the one drop rule 
the one-eighth rule, the blood impurity standard applied to blacks in America. Jesuits continued with this ancestral impediment of origin against Jews until 1946, a surviving hint of a deformed gene in the Jesuit DNA that showed itself at Georgetown. But the Jesuit crime is also evidence. We are talking about a deformed gene in the DNA of the West. Note that the primal year, 1492, the effective start of the European conquest of so-called new worlds to the South and the East and the West. Now, armed with an understanding of their own biological superiority, Christian conquistadors and colonizing settlers felt licensed by God to impose themselves on native peoples everywhere they encountered them. Columbus went west, but not long before him, a Castilian armada had gone south, establishing the first European settlement below the Sahara, Elmina in present-day Ghana, which went from being the site of a gold mine to being by far the most important trading post for the export of kidnapped Africans. And as we learned from Sir Hilary Beckles here at NYU, it was Africans who first designated these conquering Europeans as white, a labeling the Europeans readily ratified and reified as a justifying emblem of superiority over legions of black captives who would, across hundreds of years, underwrite modernity's transatlantic economic boom. Thus, the invention of whiteness served as an essential element in the coming of global commerce, finance capitalism, the nation state, and ironically, liberal democracy, an unprecedented structure of social organization depended on new post-feudal arrangements of power that transcended ties of family, tribe, hierarchical order and geography, transcending all categories but the one of race. All of this comes to a kind of head in Boston, where I was assigned as a priest at the end of 1968, the year of Dr. King's murder and of Bobby Kennedy's. But if by then, that civil rights hero, Dr. King, and that Irish politician, Bobby, had come to be allies, and they had, the relations between Blacks and the Irish in Boston were in a downward spiral toward all out animus. And I saw it close. I was the Catholic chaplain at Boston University from 1969 to 1974, when I resigned from the priesthood. The past is never dead, Faulkner's famous cliche. It isn't even past. After 1492, the European colonial intrusion brought English settlers to Massachusetts. Oh, what a lovely story that is. The Puritans, those pilgrim hats and buckle shoes, a tale we Americans will love telling ourselves again next week at Thanksgiving. 
beleaguered religious dissenters seeking only freedom, the city on a hill to enlighten the world, Boston, the cradle of liberty, a noble patrimony that the New England establishment would forever celebrate. Virginia, for example, was the birthplace of slavery while Massachusetts was the birthplace of abolition. As I arrived in Boston, its self-celebrating Brahmin establishment was in contemptuous high dungeon against the Irish racists of Southie and Charlestown, whose whites only neighborhoods were walled off sacred turf. I deplored the on display bigotry of my fellow mix. But an old question still looms the one those Chicago riots had implied but not fully raised decades before. If whiteness is a way of organizing power, not a statement about biology, what center of power was benefiting from the heartbreaking, enraging, and to me humiliating Irish embrace in Boston of the foulest aspects of anti-Black racism. The city on a hill, really? Those first Puritan settlers were theocrats who would kill you for the barest hint of religious dissent. Ask Mary Dyer, a Quaker who was hanged on Boston Common. John Winthrop gave his city on a hill sermon in 1630. There were slaves in Boston as early as 1638. The Plymouth Plantation pilgrims buckled shoes and all, enslaved Native Americans, and launched what would ultimately become a genocidal war against them. The Puritan descended Brahmin elite of the 19th century would treat the famine Irish as moral degenerates when they washed up on Boston shores. But even then, that elite was bringing the culture and economy of a ruthless finance capitalism into its own, slyly basing its fortunes on the middle passage slave trade, and then on the manufacture of cotton goods that depended entirely on a silent partnership with Southern slave masters. And who were those Irish who washed up here? One needn't buy into the myth and the phrase Elisa White used last week of an Irish exclusion from the global phenomenon of racism to grasp the peculiar relationship to racism that history long imposed on the Irish. While the English Puritans in Massachusetts were subduing the Wampanoag peoples, their cousins across the Atlantic were doing the equivalent to Irish Catholics, a savage program of total economic subjugation was underway in Ireland. At that very time, a successful project of atrocity and ethnic cleansing that Hitler could envy. While the New England settlers were finishing off the last of native resistors in what by per capita measures of the dead was one of the bloodiest wars in American history. The last of the Irish resistors to the English invaders were being crushed. The Battle of the Boyne in 1690, the Penal Code in 1691, iconic dates, and that twinned events perennial resonance suggests how for the Irish all of this is yesterday. And all of this, of course, was mere prelude to the trauma of the famine or of the hunger, as we prefer to call it, since a famine is an act of God, while what befell Ireland in the mid 19th century was an act of the British. But if the arriving Irish in Boston were traumatized, their arrival traumatized Boston in 1845, something like one out of 50 there was born in Boston. By 1855, the ratio 
was one out of five and the city despised them. So why should the Boston Irish character not have been stamped with aggressiveness cloaked as ingratiation, anger as wit, loyalty above all to family and kin, neighborhood, and a ferocious insistence on what few rights could be regarded as theirs. Yet a momentous flip occurred, having been savagely targeted by what were, yes, the white supremacist intrusions of the English against their own home island. The emigre famine Irish discovered in their new home, just as the crucible of slavery's climax was ignited, that now in effect, they themselves were white, which as Hillary Beckles reminds us, they had never been before. The Boston Brahmin overclass were America's version of the English landlords at home. So the Irish readily transferred their resentment, but from a distance and with that inbred deference. Their restricted situation, on the other hand, no Irish need apply, openly invited them to direct their fiercest hatred at someone else. Blacks. To repeat an image, if the busing crisis of the 1970s is the urtext of Irish Black antagonism, this history is the context. The busing story is well known. Through the 1960s, the Boston School Committee refused to redress the racial imbalance in the city schools. In 1972, the Boston NAACP filed a lawsuit. The school committee still refused. In June 1974, a federal judge ordered the school committee to redress the racial imbalance by transporting thousands of students across neighborhood boundaries on buses. The Irish of Southie and Charlestown resisted under banners that read, Roar for Restore Our Alienated Rights. In September, the busing was carried out in 79 of 80 schools. The one holdout was South Boston High School. Irish mothers knelt in the streets saying the rosary. Dads and brothers clack their hockey sticks on the pavement. No, no, no. By then I had left the priesthood and rented an apartment I could afford in South Boston. My window looked out on the Tuckerman School on 4th Street. Each morning I saw motorcycle police escort little black children through a gauntlet of hostile whites. Down the block, I could see the storefront headquarters of the South Boston Marshals, a blatantly white supremacist group that proudly displayed above their door a lynched effigy of the federal judge. Too much. I volunteered to serve as a court appointed monitor and I rode the bus with black children up the hill to South Boston High. There, Irish protesters, Irish protesters, greeted the black teenagers by imitating monkeys and apes. Grotesque. Notwithstanding the facts that the federal judge who ordered busing, W. Arthur Garrity, was himself Irish, and the mayor, Kevin White, and most of the cops who enforced the integration were Irish. The Irish of Boston 
had monumentally disgraced themselves. Boston would be a scene of racial conflict for most of the next 20 years. An entire generation of Boston children would be traumatized. And Boston's version of white flight would be accelerated. Last year, Boston's public schools were 42% Hispanic, 33% Black, 14% White, 9% Asian. Yesterday, it was announced that enrollment in the public schools has dropped below 50,000 for the first time ever, an ongoing shrinkage. From many points of view, busing failed. But that ignores an overriding moral mandate. The policy and implementation could have been better. But busing in Boston was right. What are we to make of all this? And to ask the question of this conference, where do we go from here? I've cited Professor Nikhil Singh's statement as a kind of mantra. Whiteness is a way of organizing power, not a statement about biology. Boston has been a classic instance of power organized to protect, well, power with the powerless set against each other in racial conflict. Imperial power works this way, a pattern seen wherever the British empire ruled, Hindus against Muslims in India and Pakistan, Christians against Muslims in Sudan, Jews against Arabs in Palestine, and of course, Protestants against Catholics in Northern Ireland. Victim groups treating each other as the enemy, while the overlords reap profits, social prestige, and the appearance of moral superiority. But economic power, considered more generally, functions this way too, as is seen in the United States today where red state working class whites are encouraged to scapegoat blacks, immigrants, and the coastal elites as the sources of their discontent. This entirely ignores the way <clears throat> in which the United States of America over the last 50 years has been taken hostage by Republican enabled corporate interests whose projects of deregulation, tax cuts, deliberate wage stagnation, government paralysis, unfettered free market piracy, and phony culture wars have obliterated the social contract and despoiled the common good. The result is a stewing social misery from which the privileged imagine they are immune but it is a lethal stew that has boiled over lately in the present American crisis of democracy that threatens everyone. The recovery from this catastrophe begins when we directly face what led to it and what it really was, which has been my purpose here. And I take it that has been the purpose of this Glucksman's Ireland House undertaking at NYU. I want to conclude by returning to the politics of Boston today, which after this long sorry tale does offer a signal of the possible way forward. Michelle Wu, a woman of color, the city council, a rainbow, 
the end of a century long Irish political dynasty whose time is properly up, even if such politics was the only opening the Irish had. I love Boston. I am so grateful to have made my life here with my cherished family, not least Contentious Boston has grounded me in my Irish identity. But as a typical Irishman, I prefer contention to loneliness. As a typical Irish Catholic, I know that the purpose of confession is not consolation, but conversion which is my hope for this confession, a conversion away from the terrible wages of whiteness. Thank you so much for that beautiful, um, beautiful lecture um, from which we've all learned so much. I've been um, reading the comments as they've been coming in um, and, uh, and clearly moved so many. Um, I, I'm just gonna kick us off with one question and then open it up to uh, our, our, our wonderful audience. So I wonder if people can begin to put their questions into the chat. Um, as we begin, and I will look for them there. Um, as you concluded, I was thinking myself, um, as I often do, about the the narratives that we that we have, the stories that we tell about this particular city that that we share, uh, Boston, right? Often uh, paradoxical narratives. You know, Boston as uh, the heart of the abolition movement, and Boston as the most racist city in America. Uh, these kind of multiple, sometimes competing narratives. Um, and I wonder if you might um, speak a little bit about those narratives, right? Uh, the, the presence or the absence of, of class within those narratives, perhaps the relationship between race and class there. Um, how do you think about um, the kind of identity of the city um, in this long, uh, long, long durée that, you, that you've outlined for us? Well, thank you, Kendra, for that complicated question, inviting me to complicate. <laughs> which is always a good idea. Boston is a complicated city and the Irish story is a complicated story. I know, for example, I'm very moved, for example, by the counter story that we could be telling about the Irish in relationship to black influence. I spoke of 1968 and nine, 69, my arrival in Boston, Boston's falling off the cliff into panicked anti-Black racism on the part of the Irish. At the same time in 1969, I think 69, a group of Irish Catholics in Northern Ireland in resistance to the increasing pressures of an oppressive British presence in Northern Ireland deliberately imitated Dr. King's Selma to Montgomery march, or was it March Montgomery to Selma? And they marched from Belfast to Derry. Hundreds, I don't know, maybe more than that, people. Uh, and in explicit terms, announced themselves as inspired by Dr. King, who of course had been murdered only months before. And not surprisingly, perhaps, that, that March too was attacked by mobs. And when they arrived in Derry, there was a brutal confrontation with the British forces. And of course, at the moment, at that moment, what, what, what was so important to those folks about Dr. King was his prophetic embrace and, and preaching of nonviolence because 
Irish resistance at that moment was horribly tempted by the dead end and the evil of violent, murderous resistance, which we saw from the IRA, especially the provisionals. And Ireland was desperate for an alternative way of resisting. And they found it in Dr. King. And the person who emerged most powerfully from that very moment in Derry was John Hume, whom I was privileged to know slightly later, who proudly always found it possible in most of the talks I ever heard him give, proudly talked about the portrait of Dr. King that he had on his living room wall in his modest house in Derry. That's the Irish story too. It's a counter story to what was happening in Irish Boston, where few people in Southie or Charlestown had portraits of Dr. King in their walls, alas. Can we um, acknowledge that we're both of these at once, we Irish? Of course we have, we, we must. And as you gathered in my presentation, I'm determined not to scapegoat the victim peoples who are responding to impossible pressures, especially when they're when those pressures are coming from people who presume to criticize them for their wickedness. And that's so much the Boston story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I'm, where you ended there, um, you know, in my own work, I think about um, Black and Native relations in the South and Southwest and, and the, the so many efforts that take place in the name of freedom, right? But often, um, uh, you know, what's being kicked around is the same same plot of land, right? But both sides in the name of freedom or in the name of sovereignty in that case. There's a question from Kim and then several more that have come in. So I'll turn it over to Kim. Thanks, Kendra. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jim, for a really moving talk and one that's gotten me um, remembering a lot, having grown up in Boston at that time in that area. And I... Um, I'm thinking as you're talking about what was going on in South Boston of um, Michael McDonald's memoir, All Souls or Easter Rising, I'm not sure which one it's in, but he describes living in South Boston at the time, which was, um, I think, statistically the poorest white ethnic neighborhood in the country um, where, He's trying to sort of make sense of that time. Um, we're, we're the same age. And he, he talks about being involved in the protests against Black kids coming into South Boston. And um, says, you know, even his brother was sort of depicted on the front page of the Globe, like throwing bottles at buses. And he shows the picture and it's, it's the one I vividly remember seeing as a kid. Um, but what's so interesting about his discussion is that he talks about how, you know, growing up in poverty, like deep poverty, with a lot of problems within his family, um, the racial explanation for both <clears throat> what the people needed to protect and the little that they had served a kind of purpose. But it was when he went to work in Roxbury, um, forming kind of common cause with other people for different reasons, he begins to understand the similarities between whites in South Boston at the time and <clears throat> black people in Roxbury. And that their fundamental uh, common interests was that they were poor. They were, didn't have enough economic um, possibility and access. And um, I guess I'm wondering what, how you understood South Boston at that time, because I only have my memories as a child, but you were an adult. And, and how you think class played a role in those protests and how you might, in a way that makes the white supremacy, um, the investment in a kind of racialized belonging uh, 
even more complicated to continue the theme. Well, you invite me to make explicit what's implicit in my remarks, which you, one could do a version of my remarks from a simple class analysis with, with class as the main le lens through which to view this history as opposed to race. And that would be useful. And many of the same themes would emerge. Yeah. And it's a common, we, we're, we're aware now of the ways in which class structures too are impossible for people to overcome uh, by simple uh, pleas of uh, merit to morality and to the goodness of the oppressor. No, structures of law, politics, social investment, the, the social contract that the community is committed to the freedom and survival and thriving of every member, which is why we take care of one another in a community that works. And, and so, yes, uh, working class, white, ethnically defined, and you know, we saw last week the commentaries about the rise of ethnic awareness, which was partly a reaction to the, a reaction, a threatened reaction to the arrival of black awareness. But it's also important not to equate the experience of both victim groups, because it was really only the blacks who were always struggling against structures of law that were designed exactly to stop them. There was no redlining that prevented Irish people from moving from South Boston to Quincy and to Braintree. And so they did in droves. Redlining and structures of bank loans and structures of real estate taxes made that move impossible comparatively for black people. So it isn't just that there are two victim groups, each of whom have a complaint. No, in our structure, the, the economy, the politics, the, the government is committed to a kind of quiet, polite version of Jim Crow. And it's still at work. And that's what we're hearing. I don't, this is what we're learning from our black brothers and sisters. And, and it isn't just to confront the power of the transatlantic slave trade and how it underwrote the invention of modernity, as I suggest, even liberal democracy. The ideals of liberal democracy were made possible because the people who articulated its ideals were slaveholders or they were manufacturers of cotton that depended on slaveholders. So even liberal democracy, all men are created equal, is a gift to the world from slaves who have not been thanked, much less compensated. Isn't that, I mean, so this deep level of structural injustice, that's why it's a, such a difficult moment for, for everyone, Europeans, Americans, because we haven't figured out yet how to address it. I mean, my goodness, we can barely pass an infrastructure bill that's about poisoned water which is horrible enough, but we're talking here about structures of deep inhuman oppression to go farther into the culture than even the lead pipes. We need an articulation. We need, and it can happen because it happened with Dr. King. Dr. King arrived at a moment and articulated in a way that could be heard by whites as well as blacks, the deep level of change that had to come. So it can happen. That's the great privilege of people of my age, old coots. We've seen these great moments. We've seen the horrors of it too, but we have seen these great moments. The partnership of Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King and the way in which Bobby Kennedy for a moment emerged as the white figure who actually carried the confidence of black folks. He's the last American politician who was naturally at home with white working people and resisting black people. 
And don't, don't forget how he began his remarks the night that Dr. King was murdered. He stood up, stood up on the hood of that car in Indianapolis and he began by saying, my brother was murdered by a white man too. And it was that establishment of a common bond of suffering mm -hmm. that meant so much uh, for a whole broad population. And then when Bobby himself was murdered, we're still orphaned in a way. I'm not saying that as a Kennedy aficionado. I, I'm saying that as a, as a kind of comment on the hole into which American politics fell then. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I know we are just about out of time. It, Kim, shall I ask one, uh, one more question from our chat? Okay, um, is, there are several that came in um, to the question of class consciousness and, and we've addressed that uh, to some degree here. And another, um, thank you for a brilliant talk, Mr. Carroll. This is from William Long. How would you view the historical role of Boston's multiple institutions of higher education? in either helping or hindering the cause of racial equality and justice. Um, and we, I guess I might add on to that, thinking about kind of, um, you know, symbolic versus substantive change that might come out of this particular place we call home. It's an important question, especially for a conference sponsored by a great university and involving so many significant academics. As you remember my saying, I was at Boston University and Boston University was proud that Dr. King was an alumnus. Um, all of the great universities in Boston are part of what makes Boston such a thriving and relatively humane and progressive place. But the universities too are deeply complicit in this structure of injustice. I was talking in general terms about corporations and corporate America and, the, and finance capitalism, the universities have sold their souls to the corporations. Um, and in Boston, the Boston, the great Boston universities, they're all somehow or other complicit with the great Boston corporations that are at the heart and soul of, for example, the military industrial complex, the, the geniuses that make our ingenious weapons and that continue to threaten the planet with uh, nuclear holocaust because we refuse to step back from Cold War commitments to a nuclear arsenal. A lot of that is generated in Boston with the uh, great work of Boston scientists who are sponsored by universities. I'm thinking just off the top of my head of Raytheon, but it's only one of many. Um, so universities have the same kind of reckoning to do that churches have to do. We heard powerfully today about the work that churches have to do, the Jesuits, the Catholics, obviously other religious denominations. Nobody is innocent of this, nobody. And the universities are places now where such challenges are being launched powerfully and it's moving and the incremental steps, I with, my son just two days ago stood in Harvard Yard and looked at the plaque on Wadsworth House where the presidents of Harvard used to live with the names of two of the slaves that worked for two of Harvard's presidents and lived in that house. A little plaque with the, with the names of two slaves, a tiny, small gesture, not anything toward enough but we heard that powerful presentation this morning about Georgetown's dilemma and how to reckon with the injustice that got us to where we are. Um, we're standing still on the backs of legions of Africans who were kidnapped and then of their children and progeny who have been cursed and cursed and cursed again by our refusal to let go of our denial and our insistence on our own moral superiority. This conference has been an exemplary instance of the kind of reckoning that must happen everywhere. Thank you so much.
Um, on that note, I think I'll turn it over to Kim if there's any closing words or. Um, well, I wanna thank Kendra uh, for moderating um, and for being a part of this. We're really happy to welcome you in and to learn from your work as well, to think about the questions that um, Jim's talk leaves us with. And I, I can't thank you enough, Jim, for your lifetime of work. Um, I've said it, said it before and I'll say it again, it's been so influential on me personally, um, your, your example. Um, and just listening to you today, um, it, it um, helps me. It helps me remember the, the power of thinking clearly, communicating clearly, sharing what we know um, with each other in an attempt to, to um, move us to a, a better place. Um, and I, I can't really thank you enough. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Kendra and, and Kim, just for me to wrap up. Um, Jim, you, we could sense even on Zoom, you had the crowd in the palm of your hand. That's not easy to do in a virtual space. Thank you so much um, for the content and your delivery and for your engagement and your generosity and how you invoked all the other scholars who've come before and your 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 commitment in terms of being here with us and wrapping up and bringing together so nicely so many of the the themes and topics um it's always a privilege to work with you and we're we're so thrilled um that in a way this has kind of um finished off the conference not completely but uh what a wonderful place to bring us to. Thank you so, so much. My privilege to, to, and thank you very much to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. We'll come back on folks. We'll end this session and we'll be back on in nine minutes for um, our last session um, where we will, um, Kim and I will share our interview with um, Oscar nominated actor, um, Ruth Nega, a wonderful conversation. We encourage you to join us. Thanks again, Jim and Kendra, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>